welcome to this brand new episode of We Talk Talent, an exclusive talk show on all about talent presented by, by ETH World. In today's episode, I have with me Tushar Desai, Global Head of HR Shared Services, FIS. With nearly two decades of experience covering diverse facets of the human resource practice in areas ranging from talent and acquisition, talent management to employee centricity, Tushar has an in-depth exposure to high growth MNC organizations, having an established track record of aligning human resources with business strategy. In his current role, Tushar is interested with the responsibility of fundamentally transforming the HR delivery model by leveraging technology and analytics to help deliver value to all key stakeholders, enhancing employee experience. Welcome, Tushar. Thank you for having me. So as we begin this interview, I would like to set a little context here. Uh, so Tushar, hiring in any labor market is challenging and the pressure to demonstrate ROI has become more intense than ever in a rapidly evolving competitive marketplace. So what strategies can be used to reduce time to hire without sacrificing quality? Well, I think, uh, you know, the mantra for any organization around hiring, especially in in the sector where I belong to, that is IT and fintech uh, specifically, you know, it's it's always about uh, hiring talent, uh, hiring great talent faster. If you go to some of the services organization, it is always faster, cheaper, better, right? Uh, so that really uh, brings us to the point, you know, about time to hire and and how do you really map it back to the processes that we have, right? I think what we really need to do is to review uh, the processes that we have around uh, the hiring life cycle, uh, really look at uh, fine tuning places where we have an opportunity, say, in reducing the number of uh, rounds of interview in reducing or in possibly putting in technology wherever needed, you know, maybe technical assessment, cultural assessment, um, uh, really from a pre-boarding to onboarding life cycle perspective, wherever we can, you know, uh, introducing technology as well as refining processes. I, I think these are the two uh, uh, very strong pillars on which uh, we can really reduce the time to hire part of it without compromising on quality. Um, I, I I think I, I would also emphasize more on, on pipelining, right? Uh, time to hire is all about from when does the requisition really hit your queue to the time you really bring somebody within the door, right? Now, that is the way we have conventionally done hiring for a real long time, right? I think we need to move from a requisition-based hiring to really going on to, to uh, possibly say a manpower-based hiring, strategic workforce-based hiring, you know, where you, you are anticipating demand and you are really managing it via pipeline. Right. And, and that is what uh, would, would really, uh, you know, affect the time to hire. You know, how fast can you really match up to uh, anticipated demands? Right. And then that's what we really need to focus on. At FIS, uh, if I can take 10 seconds more, at FIS, we've kind of invested in uh, uh, world class HR technology, especially in the TA field. Uh, we've kind of, to give you an example, we have kind of, uh, focused on say a phenom people, you know, which is a candidate relationship management tool, right? Which really harnesses all the all the candidates which are coming in through your career side, both internally as well as externally. So what it does is it gives you a de facto pipeline, right? So next time when I'm really uh, looking at hiring for a certain skill set, right? I just go into that pipeline of interested candidates rather than going out laying a net uh, around, uh, say, uh, you know, people who are not really interested in, in uh, working for FIS, right? So I think that's that's my long one short uh, to your question. Thank you for that answer, Tushar. So at a time when companies are competing for top talent, employer branding can be incredibly influential in a candidate's consideration while they are choosing to work with a particular organization. So how do you go about building and maintaining a strong employer branding to attract the right candidate? I think it's all about authenticity. And uh, we were, I was just speaking to uh, uh, to the masters in the game, you know, and that is indeed, right? Um, I was speaking to Rohan and, you know, I'll 
take a leaf out of something which he kind of keeps on uh, uh, emphasizing. He, along with uh, the MD Sashi, keeps on uh, re-emphasizing, you know, authenticity is key towards uh, employer branding. You know, if let's take the example of my organization once again. You know, if we are saying we are the leaders in the fintech world, right? Uh, you know, it, it means that my entire process, right? Uh, say the hiring process has to also reflect that same branding, right? If I'm the number one banking technology organization in the world, you know, am I using technology effectively towards my hiring process, towards my employee life cycle, right? From hire to retire, right? Is technology really touching the lives of people? Right, uh, authenticity, as I said, you know, if 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 I stands for certain values, right? If it stands for a certain purpose, right? Is that reflected in everything that we do, right? Um, uh, right from uh, the pre-boarding part of it or the hiring side of it till the time an employee decides to quit or retires from our organization, right? So I think uh, that authenticity is 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 one of the pillars of, of employer branding. And the other is obviously to really focus on inbound, right? Um, it's in today's world, anybody wanting to join any organization, right? Any organization for that matter, right? Would not really go first onto the website, right? They'll first possibly check out something like a glass door. They'll check out uh, uh, reviews on, on some of the hiring platforms like uh, Nokri, Monster, um, indeed, right? What is what is it that employees are really talking about about that particular organization, right? Social media, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? And that's where uh, again, you know, uh, organization should be really investing as far as technology is concerned, as far as TA tools is concerned. And if I is sorry, <clears throat> has kind of invested in in a tool uh, we used to use OK to post earlier. But now we have kind of taken in sprinkler as an employee advocacy tool, you know, and that's where authentic stories, real stories of real people within the organization are reflected over there, right? And that really helps your cause, right? Because then you have people who are really showcasing the values of FIS as real people. It's not about we saying we are this and and then uh, suddenly the real reality is something different for somebody else, right? So I think that's that's these these two would be the guiding principles around employer branding for us. Sure, Vishal. Thank you. Uh, so building on this question only, in the long term, it is also important that employees' beliefs and their behaviors are in alignment with their employer's core values and company culture. So while this is a tricky situation, is it is also critical in today's workplaces as well. So how should organizations work around identifying and hiring candidates with the right cultural fit? See, I think uh, cultural fit is a minefield, if you really ask me. Um, cultural fit in, in layman's term for you and me would be somebody who matches up to our um, our core values, beliefs, uh, ways of working, et cetera, et cetera, right? We can, we can put in uh, life we have over here in FIS. We can put in uh, cultural assessments. We can, we can put in uh, specific checkpoints around uh, culture fit, you know? But I would say we should also go one step further from not lo only looking at matching the culture, but also about how can somebody do a culture add for us? You know, how can they complement rather than just only matching, right? And one of the things uh, that we have done uh, very effectively within our organization, I can possibly speak about it, is uh, there has to be a very common language, very common identifiers, very common... Uh, uh, markers, uh, common personas, very, very, that's how you would possibly, you, me, anybody else assessing any candidate should be able to identify it, that you need to weed out that kind of personal bias which comes in uh, during the interviewing process, right? And one of the things that FIS did was to possibly create that kind of consistency by putting in a rubric about what would be some of those cultural parameters um, or markers, you know, uh, and what would be those personas per se, right? So it doesn't matter whether you are interviewing or I am interviewing, you know, as long as somebody is checking against those markers um, uh, through that cultural assessment uh, questionnaire or cultural assessment tool platform that we have, right? That's how you possibly get people uh, who are closest to your culture. 
And once again, I said, you know, it's not about culture fit only. It's also about culture ad. Thanks, Tushar. Uh, we would like to explore another area here. Uh, in a modern workplace journey, employees are like co-partners. Uh, they're well-informed and aware, and they say matters. So providing feedback is an essential part of workplace recognition these days. Organizations with great feedback culture are seen as investing in talent. So how to create opportunities for employees to provide such feedback and feel heard? And how can organizations use this feedback to improve workplace? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you bang on, you know, it's today's organizations and today's uh, um, workforce, if I can put it that way. And, you know, if you see largely around us, uh, obviously we have large, well-established organizations having a very mix of demographic profiles, right? So um, say a baby boomer or a Gen X or a Gen Y would, that's a common myth, right? Would have a different kind of uh, expectancy uh, versus say a millennial or a Gen Z or something like that, right? Um, I think feedback is something that everyone craves for. Um, what organizations uh, like ours are doing is, is they are making it absolutely democratic. They're making it absolutely accessible and they're making it a two-way kind of a mechanism, if I can put it that way, right? Let's take our performance management system, which is uh, known as Performance 365. That's how we call it. And there is a reason why we, we have, it's a crowdsource label, by the way. Uh, we call it Performance 365 because it's anytime feedback. A manager can give anytime feedback to the employee or an employee can give anytime feedback back to the manager. Uh, we have multiple interventions as far as collecting and collating uh, the feedback that we need, you know, pulse surveys, uh, dipstick surveys, you have uh, add-on surveys into activities or projects that we would have done. And all of that is, uh, is, is as I said, is a two-way street, right? It's not only about uh, them collecting that employee uh, feedback from the employee, right? It's also about circling back on the probable action taken on, on the feedback that we have received, right? Give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, say if we are, we are getting in or seeking feedback during say town halls of, of our uh, leaders, right? And say somebody has given some kind of feedback during those town halls, you know, it, we make it a point that there is a circle back either from that leader's office or from the HR team over here, you know, HR in FIS is known as the people office, right? Either of us really circles back uh, with that employee uh, to give a response to the feedback that he or she may have provided. There is visible action which is shown against the feedback which has been received. And I think that has been a key uh, towards encouraging and, and uh, a culture of, uh, of feedback within our organization. Um, that's great to know, Tushar. So as we... Uh... Well, you know, we are about to conclude this interview. We'd like to highlight the DNI agenda here. It is one of the important issues for businesses today worldwide. Um, but it's not enough to, you know, just hire people of different nationality and races and gender. Uh, but a sense of belongingness, safety, and freedom matters a lot. So, what organizations must or should do to develop effective diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies to create truly inclusive workplaces? I think the key over here from a DEI perspective, and I can speak about it because I'm the I'm also a part of uh, a very uh, specific team you know, which focuses around uh, inclusion of people persons with disabilities, right? Um, and I'm part of the larger diversity uh, steer committees over here also. Um, I would say there are two uh, or one single silver bullet towards. Uh, DAI initiatives in any organization that this make it consequential. Um, one is we've, we've always seen uh, and we kind of see this fairly regularly in large organizations is that they possibly attach it to goal sheets and all of it and then people will say okay so let's take gender diversity right so people say okay so we are about 70 percent males and 30 percent females so now we have a target of uh, reaching up to 40 etc etc right Organizations of uh, of repute like ours, you know, we also have to walk the tightrope around 
some of these affirmative actions as well as uh, showcasing ourselves as um, equal employment opportunity co corporations, right? Um, so it's very important that you cultivate the ecosystem to facilitate DEI uh, initiatives, right? Let's take example of hiring, right? Uh, do you, you should be able to ensure it's not that certain positions are called out as, as uh, diversity roles or something like that. Rather what I would say, you know, and that's it's largely a personal opinion is you should ensure that the pipeline, say if you're for a certain role, if you're sending in five profiles, you should ensure that out of those five, at least uh, two are, are of a different uh, or are diverse, right? Either from a gender perspective or either from, um, uh, say, uh, veterans or, or persons with disabilities or something like that, right? So that makes sure that the pipeline is diverse, right? Second part is um, about the interviewing panel, right? If the panel is of a certain configuration, right? You should be able to insert specifically and strategically. There should be one person from a certain uh, gender or from a certain background, right? Like PWD or like uh, veterans or something that in that uh, panel to ensure that there is there is the right balance over there, right? And the last part I would say is is uh, as I said, is to make it consequential. You know, if for for leaders and managers to move up the value chain or to showcase themselves as uh, as achievers, you know, they should be able to show what they have done from a DEI perspective. How diverse are their teams? How many opportunities they've been able to give uh, to the various uh, segments in their team, right? And along with mentorship opportunities, right? How many have they mentored, right? For them to really move up the chain, to be called as the as a leader, or for them to even progress in their careers in this organization, right? I think these are some of the things that we should be really focusing on. Well, thank you, Tushar. This has been a great talk. Uh, thank you for sharing all these interesting insights with us. It was a pleasure hosting you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And to the viewers, we'll see you in the next episode of We Talk Talent. Keep watching.